Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Fall is in the air, amen? Amen. Feels good. Feels really good. Okay, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to pick up in there. But before we get to Matthew 21, does anybody happen to know what yesterday was? It was a Jewish feast. It was Rosh Hashanah. That's right. Who said that? (laughs) Nice. You saw it on the news. Okay, all right. (laughs) So yeah, so Rosh Hashanah has really kind of adopted more of a secular understanding in Judaism today. They see it as a new year. Um, It's kind of lost its religious connotations, its biblical roots, okay? So let me just kind of give us a a background on what this is, and it's going to lead and guide us into Matthew chapter 21. Um, Okay, so what we have, Rosh Hashanah is a new year uh, for the Israelites, But what it is more specifically is it's a new spiritual year for them, okay? So it's kind of an odd spot to put it, but it's marks, it's the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. And the Old Testament is called the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is really interesting. It's a it's a one day, it's a one day event. God commanded Moses to make two silver trumpets. These trumpets were to give, uh, they, they were to make announcements. So like depending how they blew in the trumpet would give a message to all of Israel. When you've got a lot of people out there, how do you get that message relayed, right? They didn't have a PA system or microphones and speakers and such. They would blast trumpets. And the way that they blasted their trumpets would signal what it was that all the camp was supposed to do. So um, if they made a long blast, it was to, it indicated something. A short succession blast, is, blast it meant something. And there was this series uh, within this, okay? But the Feast of Trumpets is very interesting. It's to mark this, this spiritual beginning, a spiritual new year, because the holiest day in the Hebrew calendar was coming called Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. So for 10 days, when the trumpet blasts and it marked the Feast of Trumpets, then they were to reflect... Uh, for 10 days recognizing that there is this moment in time in which they're going to have to really uh, come face to face with God, physically speaking, with Yom Kippur, that their sin requires a sacrifice. Their sin separates them from God. And so it was this time of reflection for 10 days coming to Yom Kippur. And then another five days after Yom Kippur is the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, remember, in Matthew 21, when they're throwing down all the palm branches in front of Jesus, they were applying Jesus fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles, but what feast was Jesus fulfilling at that point? Passover, okay? He was fulfilling Passover. So the reason why they were blending these two, these uh, spring festival and a fall festival is because they were recognizing This Messiah figure, possibly Jesus is a Messiah, because remember, the crowd say that this is simply a prophet. They weren't identifying him, that this is God in the flesh. They're saying this is a prophet. And they were blending these these holidays, these feasts together, laying down the palm branches, thinking that he was coming in and fulfilling Zechariah 14. Okay? But what's really cool about this, the reason why I even bring this up is because Jesus has fulfilled the four spring feasts. He's fulfilled them. And what's really awesome about this is we are waiting for Jesus to fulfill the three fall festivals. We're waiting for him to fulfill the Feast of Trumpets. We're waiting for him to fulfill Yom Kippur. And we're waiting for him to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. So kind of in a nutshell, Jesus, as we're coming to this point in Matthew, He is fulfilling all the requirements of Passover. He is fulfilling all the requirements of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is fulfilling the Feast of First Fruits when he's raised from the dead. This is why Paul said he is the first fruit from the dead. What does any of this matter? I've often heard that all of these feasts, that those are just Jewish things. They really have no significance or any bearing on Christianity. What I want to try and do is dispel that presupposition. They do have significance. Now, what I want to also say, as Paul says in Colossians 2, that these things were a shadow of what was to come, that Christ is the fullness of them. Let no one cast judgment upon you, whether you keep the Sabbath or you don't keep the Sabbath, the new moons, the feasts and festivals and holiday, for they were all but a shadow, and Christ is, is, is the full. Amen? 
okay. But when we study these things out and we see the significance of what's taking place, it's really cool. Let me just give you an example. This is one of the reasons why the Bible says at the last trump, we are caught up with God and we are taken into glory, right? Y'all remember that in the scriptures? 1 Corinthians 15, what is it? 1 Thessalonians 4, I believe. Right, this last trump will sound. Well, where is he getting this last trump idea? It actually goes back to the Feast of Trumpets. And the last trump that was sound, when the, when the final like trump was blast, a long blast, it was to indicate that the last part of the camp, it, the last part of the camp was moving and, and going. So the, when the last trump of God sounds, it's when all of those that were dead in Christ, they're raised from the grave, and then all those that are living were caught up with the Lord in the air. Do you see the connection? With the Feast of Trumpets, we're waiting for that to be fulfilled at the return of Christ. What's also really cool about this is trumpets. What's the big deal with this? Think about the significance of the trumpets in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 19, when God is coming down on the mountain, there's lightning and there's thunder. And there's all of this, all of this power being demonstrated as God's coming onto the mountain. But you remember what was blasted a really long time? It was a trumpet. There's a long trumpet blast that that actually made the hearers fearful because it was shaking everything. When we looked at two weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 12, that it says, you have not come to the mountain that what, you know, and which was uh, that even if a beast touched the mountain, it was to be stoned. But you have come to the, uh, to Jerusalem surrounded by angels and festal gatherings. They're make, the writer of Hebrews making this contrast. When, the, when God came down, it, the, the, trump, the trump of God blasted, and all the people were fearful. But what was God coming there to do? He was coming there to betroth his people to himself, speak to them, call them, woo them to himself. But what did the people say? We don't want to hear any more. We don't want to interact with you. Never mind, Moses. Why don't you just go represent us to God? Why don't you just go be a mediator between us and God? Yet God was coming to everyone. Same within, same within Christ. We, we see Christ at this point. I mean, he's coming for everyone, but yet look and see how he's being rejected. He's being dispelled. He's being displaced. Like, no, 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 we don't really want you. And we're about to see more of that take place here in chapter 21. Another significant of the trumpets in the Old Testament. There is a, an Old Testament scripture. I think it's Numbers chapter 10, I think. But it talks about that if, if when, you, when, when you come into the land of the enemies and, you, and, and, they're, and they're conquering you, blast a long trumpet sound and I will remember you, says, says the Lord, and I will deliver you. Now keep that in mind. Moses is instructing the Israelites to have this understanding what the significance of the trumpets are and what they're for. So when they come, when, now with Joshua, Moses died, now with Joshua, they cross over the... the the, the Jordan River, they come into the promised land. They cannot go inherit the promised land until Joshua did what? He had to do something to all the males. He had to circumcise all the males. That seems really odd. Like, why would you do that? Well, listen to what the, what the context says. Today, once Joshua did that, God says, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, meaning you're back in covenant with me. I can't give you the covenant land that I promised and covenanted to Abraham until you're back in the Abrahamic covenant with me. So as soon as Joshua did that, God says, now I've rolled away all the reproach of Egypt from you. Joshua, go inherit the land. Go get it. Go take it. The first kingdom they come to is... Jericho, right? Jericho is a mighty fortress, a mighty army. What are they supposed to do? What was God's strategy? What, march around those walls seven days, and then on the seventh day, what were they supposed to do? March seven times and do what? Blow the trumpets and shout. And what happened? The walls came down just like Moses instructed Israelites would happen. Just like what God said would take place, just like what God said would happen. We see a similar story again with, with Gideon. Remember, God comes to Gideon. 
Gideon, all right, listen, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to have you go conquer a powerful enemy. Are you sure, Lord? I'm the least of the, of the least. I mean, I really, I'm hiding, I'm hiding in a shed trying to thresh my wheat, and I can't even thresh my wheat well because I can't go outside and do it where I need the wind to blow the chaff away. I can't even do this. Right. Are you sure that you're doing this? And he asked God a few times, right, to prove to me, show me that you are indeed asking me to do this, and it is enough. And we see Gideon asked him for a couple signs, right? Once those signs were done, Gideon's whole demeanor changes. He actually, do you know what the first thing he goes and does? He goes and destroys the altars to Baal and to Asherah. Remember, and all the people are upset. Who did such a thing, right? They're really upset. So Gideon then starts to get his men. And then what happens? The Lord says, you have too many. You have too many. We need, to, we, need, we, need to, we need to thin this out. Tell all the boys that are afraid they can go home. Who wouldn't be afraid going to war? To go war against a much more powerful, stronger, many more soldiers than you. I'm surprised the whole army didn't walk away. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, never mind, I'm out. God says I can go, I'm going home, right? But So it thins it out. God says it's still too many. Take them down to the river. Those that drink like a dog, they're out too. And Gideon is down to how, how many men? 300. 300 men. What was the strategy God gave to Gideon to go attack the army? What was it? He said, put pots in one hand and torch in another, march up to the top of the mountain, and when I tell you, break the pots, wave the torches, and shout and blow trumpets. Make a bunch of noise. I'm going to cause confusion in the camp, and they'll attack themselves. Trumpets are a big deal in the scripture. So when it comes to the Feast of Trumpets, it's not just like this little passive thing. We are also awaiting the trumpet blast of God. And there's a couple of them that we read of in the scriptures. A trumpet blast that catches us up to the Lord. Praise God. We might actually see that day. And there's a trumpet blast when the, when the King of kings and the Lord of the Lords returns. So the Feast of Trumpets is still yet to be fulfilled. That's why I bring it up. So let's go ahead and jump into Matthew chapter 21. We'll come into this. Uh, so where are we at in this passage? We're, we've looked at Jesus's what is called the triumphal entry in Christianity. We've looked at this really is not a triumphal entry. This is a civic and religious peaceful matter. Now, Jesus has a triumphal entry spiritually, but not physically. Remember the contrast we made. When the Romans do a triumphal entry, after they've conquered a people, they bring back the spoils of war with them. They get on their horses, and there's a whole procession as they come back into Rome showing this triumph that, this triumph that they've had. Delegates, when they rode donkeys, indicated that they were there for peaceful or civil matters. So here Jesus doesn't come in on a horse. He comes in on a donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9. Remember, remember how we looked at Jesus has been to the Temple Mount before. He's been at the Temple before. He's been in Jerusalem before. In fact, he's, cleaned the, he's cleansed the Temple out before. He's about to do it again. And, but as he's on the Mount of Olives, he's walking in. The Mount of Olives is on the east of the Temple Mount. He walks to the Mount of Olives and he stops. He won't take another step forward until the donkey and the colt are collected and brought to him so he can ride those in to Jerusalem, just like what was prophesied. Remember, how can you identify Jesus is actually who he says that he is? He has to come in a certain way. He has to die in a certain way. And he has to die in a, at a certain time. So he stops and waits till those things are brought to him. And then he, then he may continue. Then he may continue on into the Temple Mount. Remember the significance of that. Ezekiel talked about watching the Spirit of God leave the Temple going out from the eastern side, leaving the eastern gate, never to return. You understand, God's glory never came back to the temple after the captivity by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. The irony of this is that once the Israelites returned to the land, they set up shop again and they continued their religious practices as usual. Carrying on in the spirit of God wasn't even there. Church, how often can we just do church and carry on business as usual without the Holy Spirit here? We can so easily do the same thing in our lives. 
Let me also say one, one other thing on this. It just, it just came back to mind. I love when, when certain things fall on certain days, like when the Bible gives us, like, here's the day that it happened, you know, type thing, so you can kind of count. I think it's like 2,468 years ago, yesterday, Nehemiah completes the wall. The wall had been down for quite a long time. In about 52 days, they rebuild this wall. The people work with diligence, with purpose, with endurance, with speed, and with, with a sword in one hand and laying bricks with the other. And they rebuild this wall that had been down for like over 100 years. Nehemiah completes this wall in 52 days. Once they complete the wall, they gather an assembly. They build a platform for Ezra to come out. And do you know what Ezra read? The book of the law. He pulls out the book, the books of Moses, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and he began to read from early in the morning till noonday. Y'all want to do a six-hour service? Not only that, but check this out. They, the Bible says they stood that whole time. All, everybody that was capable of understanding, that means even down to children. They stood there and they listened. You know what happened when they heard God's word read to them? They cried. That's right, Edna. They mourned and they wept because they realized how far they left their God. They mourned and they wept. I ask you, I, I, I ask you, beloved, when we study the scriptures, when you study the scriptures, does it, does it invoke anything within you? Does it change anything within you? Or is it really fun Bible knowledge? Bible knowledge doesn't do anything to us. You know how I know that? Because the scripture says Satan has Bible knowledge and tested Jesus in the wilderness with Bible. Bible doesn't just change you, just consuming it. It's stopping and meditating, understanding what does this mean, God? What, what do you want me now to do with this knowledge that you just gave me? How should I respond? How should I strepho? You guys remember? How should I metanoia? How should I shuv? How should I amend myself, amend my ways? What, what do you want me to do with it? And it's interesting in Nehemiah 8, if you're interested in reading this story when it takes place, it says that uh, the Levites were there helping the people have understanding to what they were hearing as Ezra read. So it wasn't they were just hearing it, they were reflecting upon it. And they were recognizing, oh, there's, some, there's something that's supposed to happen within me. Something's a change, and it, it evoked a mourning and a weeping. So after they complete this, you know what Nehemiah says to them? Stop mourning and weeping. Today's not a day for that. Today is a day of joy, for the joy of the Lord is your. Now, why is Nehemiah saying something like that almost 2,500 years ago? Because it was. The first day of the seventh month, or the Feast of Trumpets. That happened almost 2,500 years ago yesterday, that that took place. And he says to them, remember, they had read the law, so they understood now what the Feast of Trumpets was all about. It's in Leviticus 23, Numbers 24, and Numbers 10. It tells them all what this thing is. Today's not a day to mourn, today's a day to have joyous celebration because today marks a new spiritual beginning for you, Israel. Rejoice. Love and notice what your God is going to do in and for you. It says the joy of God is your strength. I ask you, is the joy of the Lord your strength? We get an example of this in the New Testament. We see Jesus when this, uh, again, what we looked at two weeks ago, that it was the joy set before Jesus to endure the cross. How is that a joyful thing for Jesus to go through that? How is that joyful? How is that something that invokes this joy within him? Remember, joy and happiness are two separate things. Happiness is just a feeling. And ha happiness feeling is kind of fleeting, is it not? <laughs> we go up and down in happiness, but joy... Joy is an attitude, it's an attribute, it's a characteristic. You walk in that, you're in that, and it's a supernatural joy. Let me think. Has anybody ever heard of the fruit of the Spirit called joy? See the connection? Okay, so Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And now coming back to Matthew 21, 
Jesus is coming up to that point, and this is what's guiding him. This is what's leading him. This is giving him his strength because of the, because of the possibility and the work that he's about to do that you and I might receive the atoning work that he's done for us. That's a joyful thing to him. I'm willing to go through it again, says Jesus, if I can possibly have you. Now, he's not actually going to go through it again, okay? Once was enough. But for him to go through that, that was the joy behind him to go through that suffering, that pain, that scourging, that, that being nailed to the cross, the whole thing in hopes that we would respond to his spirit, in hopes that we would respond to what he has. Just like back in Nehemiah 8, when people heard the word and invoked this response in them, this, this, this change, although it was a temporary change, it still invoked a change within them. So I ask you, beloved, when you study through God's word, does it invoke a change? And if you wonder, where do I land on that? Is that actually happening? Read back at Matthew 13. Jesus gives four conditions of the heart of what happens when we hear the word of God. Find which one you are. It's pretty simple. The Bible's pretty simple how it lays things out. Okay, Matthew 21. So Jesus is coming in on the triumphal entry. Uh, he comes in and he is performing this great spiritual work. And verse 12, he enters the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. We discussed this at length last week, so we won't go through it again. But remember in, in, in summary what he was saying. It's Isaiah 56, where that first sentence said, it's quoted, my house shall be called a house of prayer. This was supposed to be a place where all God-fearing people could come, including the Gentiles. They're supposed to be able to come in and worship the Lord God. But he says, but instead you, he's speaking to the, the chief scribes, the chief Pharisee, uh, Sadducees, the chief priests, he's speaking to them saying, but you have made it a den of robbers. Remember that word robbers is actually in the Greek, it's implying like an insurrectionist, a terrorist. You have defected what my temple worship is supposed to be. That same indictment, you have to ask yourself, does that apply to you as well? Because you are the priests and priestess of God's kingdom today. Are you, by your actions, by your behaviors, by your words, by, by who you are, are you, are you dispelling people away? Are you um, repelling people away from God? So what, what God is saying is here, priests, you have actually defected the worship here at this place. And if Jewish sources were to be, are to be trusted, Caiaphas, the highest priest that year, took the sale of animals and money changers from the Kidron Valley and put them into the Temple Mount in the court of the Gentiles. Old Testament didn't have the separation between Gentiles and Jews. All could come up to the temple. The inner courts, only the priests could go into that point, but there was no division in the rest of it. As the religious practices and traditions began to take more and more effect, the modern-day Pharisees and Sadducees started to make these other distinctions. Well, men, you can go here. Women, you can only go to this point. Gentiles, this is as close as you can come. They started to make greater divisions. And Jesus saying, that behavior is not in line with me. Now look here. Verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. You know what's crazy about this? Is priests, according to the law, priests that were blind or lame or had some kind of physical disability, they weren't allowed to do the worship ceremony stuff. The blind and the lame was extended even further to anybody that was blind or lame or had some infirmity. They weren't allowed to come to the temple mount at all. You think that's of God? No, it ain't. Not preventing people from coming to worship him. But yet the priests were doing that. Well, they don't look like us, so we don't want them to come around here. Thank you very much. Do you all ever heard of things like that in churches? Yeah, right? The same thing. This is where we have to look and reflect. Do our hearts parallel what the Pharisees and the Sadducees' hearts were? Okay, so here we have Jesus... ask the question, how do the blind and lame know to push past the religious tradition to go find Christ? We see multiple times people that were often ostracized from society 
They don't let society keep pushing them away. They pursue after Christ anyways. And Christ heals them. He does a powerful work in them. He does something within them. They pursued him. They pursued him. Beloved, I ask you as well, do you pursue God? This God is desiring to have this interpersonal, intimate relationship with you. Do you pursue him? So they pursue him, and they come to him in the temple where they're not normally allowed. And what does Jesus do to them? He heals them. Verse 15, but when the chief priests, this would be most likely the Sadducees, and the scribes saw the wonderful things. So keep this in mind. They're seeing what Christ is doing and, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. The children are now repeating the same line that Jesus received from, from the countrymen as he was riding on the donkey. Hosanna to the son of David. And these Sadducees, these chief priests, become indignant. They're infuriated by this. Jesus then gives them the subtle rebuke. The, the, the Sadducees ask, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to him, yes. I feel like he could have just stopped there. <laughs> yep, I sure do. And just continued on his business. But he gives them this, this, this subtle rebuke. He says, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise you have prepared praise. Now, it's interesting. He's quoting from Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8 is this, is this psalm that just absolutely exalts God in all the splendor and all he creates. And it's fascinating. In the, he in the Hebrew, microphone disconnected. In the Hebrew, it actually says, out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have prepared strength. In the Greek, the Septuagint translation of the Bible, in the Greek Septuagint translation of the Bible, it says, out of the mouth of uh, infants and babes, you have prepared praise. So what's the contrast here? What's the, what's the difference? Why are they translating this differently from praise and strength? Strength in the Hebrew, and what the context is trying to give is that out of the mouth of infants and babes, you have prepared a stronghold. You prepared like a fortress-like thing, Okay. The reason why the Septuagint pulls over and it says, and it retranslates that Hebrew to praise, of which Jesus is quoting here, most likely because the Sadducees' first language was Greek. Sadducees weren't very interested in religious practices. They were really more politicians. And they had control over all the temple worship. They interacted with Rome, and they were pretty much, the, they were more of the aristocrats, an elitist group, okay? They passed the priesthood and the high priesthood to, to family lines and different, like, it was all political movements for them, okay? So he's speaking to them in their language, and he says, yes, I hear what they're saying. Have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have prepared praise? The reason why the Septuagint translates it as praise is to get the connotation over to us that it's the praise even of children that creates a stronghold and fortress. I don't know if you understand, like, let me try to get this across. What God is saying in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, that's quoted here, is that your worship and your praise of God actually creates a fortress around you and helping you get through whatever difficulty or issue or struggle you're going through. Have you ever worshipped through anything? It's not something that we kind of regularly talk about often in Baptist Christianity. But this is something that the scriptures are saying. You can worship yourself through something. Because it's creating, God is using this strong. Have you ever listened to the words that infants and babies make? <laughs> right? They're not saying anything. What God is getting at, this is the majesty of God, that even out of the babbling of infants and babes, he will create a stronghold around through that praise. Does that make sense? So Jesus is saying this to them like, yeah, look at the children understand it. But you who are supposed to be over the religious practices here don't get it. You're missing it. The children were assigning this messianic term there. There it says Hosanna son to the son um, to the son of David. They're quoting from Psalm 118. And we covered that a couple weeks ago of, of the significance of why are they going through Psalm 118? We're going to come back to Psalm 118 here in a second. These psalms are being fulfilled in Christ as this is happening. Verse 17, we see Matthew doesn't even record what the Sadducees' response was to this. 
Jesus doesn't even stick around and hear what they have to say. He says, look, verse 17, and leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. He gently rebukes them, and he turns and he goes and walks right on out. Now, remember we talked about Pas Passover is one of the pilgrimage holidays. All the males in the, in the land have to come to Jerusalem to offer a, a sacrifice, offer a Passover lamb. It's estimated that probably around 500,000 people extra came to Jerusalem. Josephus was a historian in the first century. He estimates the number was five times that amount uh, for some years. Think about that, two and a half million people coming. That's a lot of people. You're going to be hard-pressed to find a hotel, right, in a lodge at that point. So Jesus goes out. He's likely staying with Lazarus. Remember that, that fellow that he raised from the dead? Martha and Mary's brother, he leaves Jerusalem, and he's likely lodging there. Now look here, verse 18, in the morning, so this is implying the next day now, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now let's cover this real quick. This is a really odd thing for Jesus to do. He's walking to a fig tree sees the leaves on it, there are no figs on it, he curses the tree. You know what the, that was weird about this? This is the spring season. Figs don't produce figs in the spring. They come in summer or uh, early fall. We have uh, figs on our property. They come in late summer, early fall. So why is Jesus coming to a tree that won't have fruit in its right season, and he curses it because it has no fruit? Because he's, he, he's, he's, it's a metaphor to what's happening in the temple. In Israel, when the fig tree begins to grow leaves, it also grows these tiny, like, it's a polyp, basically, that it grows. It's a, they call them a green fig. It's real tiny. It's real small. It's basically like a, a little flower that has a skin over it. They're edible. They don't taste all that great, but they are edible, Okay. So the tree should have been, the fig tree should have been producing those because the leaves were on it. So it should have had the little polyps, but it had nothing. So he said, basically, fig tree, you're a fake. You're a fraud. You're, it's not right. You should be producing something. You're producing nothing. So because you produce nothing, death to you. This was an analogy of what was going on in the temple and the worship service. There should, if there was the slightest of fruit being grown through these worship acts that was taking place at the temple, God would not have cursed the temple as well. Remember what happens to the temple in AD 70? What happens? It's completely destroyed by Rome, right? Completely ransacked. Jesus even says early in the Gospel of John, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it back up. And remember what the chief priest says? It's taken us years to build this temple, and you think you can rebuild it in three days? John then gives commentary. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. Yet another indication that Jesus always knew what he was here to do. So what is Jesus saying? How does this, how does this relate to us? Christian, I need to ask you, and you need to reflect upon yourself. Are you even producing the slightest of fruit, a polyp, any little nub coming off your, your fig? Is there anything that's there? That's not something I can judge within you. That's not somebody somebody else can judge within you. You need to reflect upon yourself and ask yourself, am I even bearing the slightest, the slightest little nub and polyp of a, of a fig growing? Because what does Jesus say also in John 15? When he's given this analogy of the vine, that the Father is the vine dresser, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And the branches that don't bear fruit, what does he do? Cuts them off and he throws them in the fire. That lines up right what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, let me in. I've done all these great things in your name. And what does Jesus say? 
depart from me, I never knew you. Okay, so this, this is legitimate stuff that requires reflection, that requires us looking at this. Jesus is doing this metaphor with the fig tree. The fig tree ought to have been producing something even in the spring, those little nubs, but it wasn't producing anything, so he curses it, it withers it once, and it dies. The temple is producing zero fruit. We don't think Jesus still makes these kind of statements towards a church. Go read Revelation. Look at the way he speaks to the seven churches. He's concerned about the fruit they're making and or not making. So the same thing applies to us. The difference is it's not just about us as a church collectively. It's about you individually as a priest and priestess of the Most High God. It is so easy for us to see the, the splinter in someone else's eye and we can ignore the log in our own eye that's preventing any transformation within us. Sound familiar? So what happens here, Jesus is giving this greater metaphor and he tells his disciples, his disciples see this and they're, they're blown away. But Jesus then gives them this instruction in this lesson. But he makes it even deeper. He says, look, I say to you, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. This is a figure of speech. Jesus isn't actually saying we can go say to a mountain, get up and now drop yourself into the sea or mountain be removed. Boy, wouldn't that be nice sometimes when you need to clear land? Be moved. <laughs> or if you need to cut a tree, tree come down and, you know, that would be nice. It's a figure of speech saying something about the impossible. Something about the impossible will take place if we have faith. And then Jesus says something, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. What does that mean? Does that mean we can literally ask anything that we want? I can literally ask for whatever I want, and, it, and it's going to happen? I must ask in accordance to what? To God's will, to God's word. Right? I have to align my prayers. But notice what Jesus is saying. This isn't the only time he makes such a statement. Do you actually believe this? Do you actually believe this? That you can ask anything in prayer that's in line with his word and in line with his will and it will be done? Do you actually believe it? I will struggle with that at times. So often, one of the things in the marriage study that, that, that we went over is that our marriages are supposed to reflect the literal light of the gospel. People are supposed to see our marriages and see such godliness in them that it draws them. Our marriage actually literally draws them to Christ because they see such a difference in the marriage of Christians. Because what, Christi what, what do Christians claim? That the Spirit of God lives where? Within us then how come our marriages so often look exactly like the ones in the world? This is why unbelieving people will look at Christians and shake their head like, there ain't no God that lives in you. There ain't nothing different in you that I have. So one of the things that Christ is saying here, think back as well, when he healed so many people that we read throughout the Gospel of Matthew, what does he say healed them? Your Faith has healed you. Your trust in me. The reason why, the reason why so few of us will actually believe God will, will answer prayer. Like, I, oh, we'll say it with, 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 with our words. Like, don't get me wrong. I think I could probably go through this whole room. Does God answer prayer? Oh, yeah, he answers prayer. Absolutely. I think we'll all confess that. But it, when things get difficult and things get hard and we're really trying to pray through something or pray, pray through something pretty important, pretty deep, or to try to be rid of something internally, like, God, just take away whatever this thing is, this bondage, just change. We, 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 like st we start to, to doubt or have struggle. Jesus is literally saying, you can ask me to do it and it will be done. It will happen. There is something that's supposed to transfer out of us where we no longer live through our, just our intellect, our reasoning. 
You know the reason why we don't think God does a lot of this stuff anymore? It's because most of the time we say, because I've never experienced it. It's a dangerous thing to interpret the scripture through your experience. Would you all agree with that? Because my experience isn't authoritative upon what God says he can do and what he doesn't do. That's called subjectivity or relativity. I design and create my own truth. I create my own religion. I'll create my own God that way, which is called idolatry. That's why we have to align our thinking to this. But one of the things that we have been trying to like stress and go through when we did the message on birthright and blessing, there's so much more available to us in covenant, in Christ, in this interpersonal relationship with him. There's so much more that is there. Seek it out. Capture it. Take a hold of it. I cannot impart it to you. You have to desire to seek after it and the Spirit teach it to you. Does that make sense? So Jesus is teaching his disciples this. Now, they didn't get this, and we see them didn't understand this early, but then look at how their whole, their whole disposition changed when you come to, that, come to, that, uh, to, the, to Acts. And you see the Acts of the Apostles. You see these men operating and standing on stuff on strength that they didn't have when they were following Jesus. Do you hear that? They were walking with Jesus and didn't have that kind of intimacy with him. And what does Jesus say in John 16? It is to my, I'm sorry, it is to your advantage that I leave in order that the helper may come to you. I would have thought in the natural that it would have been better to walk with Jesus. I could put my arm around Jesus. He could put his arm around me. He could literally pray right over me. That kind of closeness, I would have thought, is a better relationship. But Jesus says, no, no, that is not better. It's actually better for you to your literal advantage for me to leave in order that I can send, not leave you as an orphan, but send you the Holy Spirit. Beloved, do you, do, do you hear what Christ is saying? Do you hear the importance of the Spirit of God living in you and through you and with you? There is something that is supposed to be utterly transforming about that. Growing us and nurturing us and developing us, turning us into the man and woman we never thought that we could be. Grow, I mean, just like this intimacy that's there. Verse 23, and when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him. So Jesus, right, remember this is the next morning. He curses the fig tree. He teaches his disciples. He moves on. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? What they're talking about, this word authority, is talking about this an, like an ordination, a laying on of hands. Who is... Who is giving you the okay to go around doing what you're doing? Who's giving you permission to do that? Now, it's not uncommon for, in this time and age, to challenge another teacher in the public. This is often how you gain a greater following. If you could, if you could shame another teacher or diminish another teacher, degrade another teacher in front of the public, he's embarrassed in humility. You now get more followers, okay? So they're attempting to do this to try and distract the people from following Christ and come back under their thinking, under their mindset, under their control. So who, who's laid their hands on you? Who's imparted all of this to you and, and, and permitted you to go and do this? Because when a new teacher was now released to go be a teacher, they weren't supposed to teach anything that their teacher didn't teach them. Jesus is teaching things that the rabbis don't teach. You understand? So they're like, who, what rabbi has permitted you to speak and teach in such a way? Also normal in the day. A teacher would ask another teacher a question. To answer the question, he, he, he would ask a question. Jesus answered them, well, I'll also ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? They discussed it among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, well, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, well, we are afraid of the crowd, for they hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, <clears throat> we do not know. And he said to them, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority, by what ordination I do these things. The story continues. 
Jesus, right, there's a break there in our Bibles, but notice the dialogue continues. Jesus continues. Well, what do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind, and, 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 and he went. Verse 30, and he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two sons did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Can I just, I, I just want you to understand, this is like the biggest slap in the face that those guys could have just got because they thought their religious practices, their self-righteousness put them in the kingdom of God. And God just said, all those people who you don't even permit in this place, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the publicans, all the dirty little sinners, they actually enter before you do. This is humiliation of humiliation on them, but it's a true statement. But look how he continues to say, verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness. So notice how they wouldn't answer by what authority John was baptizing. Jesus answers it for them. See, when John the Baptist came, he, he came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your mind and believe him. Remember how many times the Pharisees asked him, show us a sign, and then we will believe. Give us a sign, and then we'll believe. Jesus is performing countless miracles. The Gospel of John said Jesus did so many miracles. There's not enough books in the world to record all that Jesus did. It wasn't about signs. It wasn't about any, any of this. It wasn't about, you know, it was only about their heart transformation. John is told by, his, Jesus tells him that John came in the way of righteousness, meaning God gave him his authority to go and do what he did. But you did not believe. See, if the Pharisees would have said that John the Baptist was baptizing in the authority of the Father, that God gave him, his authority came from heaven, what did John the Baptist testify when he saw Jesus? Behold the, the Lamb of God who's come to do what? Take away the sins of the world. See, so if they confessed that John the Baptist, his authority to baptize and do his ministry was from God, and John made this testimony concerning Jesus as the Messiah, and they rejected it, they're guilty of rejecting. What I'm trying to pull, like pull together, trying to keep all the gospel of Matthew, you know, swirling in your head as well as the other gospel accounts. Remember the unpardonable sin? Jesus, Jesus condemns this generation for the unpardonable sin. They refuse to believe the Holy Spirit's testimony, confessing that this is indeed. Remember a voice spoke from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Remember the Spirit of God came and rested upon him. In physical form, people could see that happen. There's also a time in which John chapter 12, we don't have time to lay this in here and show how this uh, falls in here, but... Jesus says, you know, now that my soul is troubled, what then shall I say? Father, remove me from this hour, this difficult moment that I'm coming to, the, namely the cross and Gethsemane. Father, remove me from this hour? No. But for this purpose, this is the reason why I came. And then John records a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. But those that heard, some thought it was an angel that spoke and others just heard thunder because it's a hard issue. Jesus says to you and me that my sheep will know my voice. If the Spirit of God was to speak to you, would you even know what his voice sounds like? Every Christian should be able to say, yes, I know what the voice of God sounds like. I know him that personally. I know him that intimately. There should be this literal change, this thing that, that, that is happening. So Jesus answers. John did come under the authority of God. And that's also my authority. Even when you saw the things that John did and I did, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Let me run through this really quick because this is all one dialogue and we'll close here. 
Hear another parable, because he's all saying this at the same time to these religious elites. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in scriptures the stones that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous. And is it marvelous in our eyes? Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Let me paraphrase this here real quick for us, because there's actually multiple Old Testament passages that are all in sign here. There's Isaiah 5, there's Isaiah 8, there's Daniel 2, there's Jeremiah 23, um, and Ezekiel 34. All of these Old Testament contexts are in mind as Jesus is giving this parable. They realize that Jesus is talking about them. Let me read verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived, rightly by the way, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Twice now, they would not do what they wanted to do because they feared the people more than they feared God. Okay, so the point is here. If this was true blasphemy, Right? If this was a true significant spiritual issue that required the death of this man, they shouldn't worry about what the crowds say, worry about what man says. They should be worried about what God says. But clearly this isn't about what God says or his holiness. Because Jesus says, if you understood what was happening, you would have changed your mind concerning me and concerning John. But they don't change their mind. They stay at this way. And Jesus is saying, look, this parable that happened, Jesus sent prophets. The Lord sent prophets in the Old Testament before the Babylonian captivity. He's saying to them, those are the first uh, servants that went out to collect the fruit, but you wouldn't listen. You refused to listen to them, and you went into captivity. Assyria destroyed the north. Babylon destroyed Judah, the south, and they were all taken into captivity and dispersed. You refused to listen. I brought you back to the land. I sent more prophets. I've even, now Jesus is even talking about, I sent the greatest prophet. Who is that? Well, it's the son, it also comes, but who does Jesus say is the greatest prophet? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. I've even sent the greatest of all the prophets, and you refuse to listen to him as well. You kill them also. Surely the father will now send his son, and you'll listen to him. But no, no, no. You actually, again, you terrorist insurrectionists. Remember how he called them that before. This shows the great chasm. And all of their religious, pious figure, they look like they were people of God. They had it on their lips, but their heart was what? Far from him. Jesus uses that indictment on them before. All of this stuff is coming into context. When you read Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34, you see God actually is cursing the shepherds and the prophets. That they are prophesying visions I never gave them. It's things out of their own mind. They just do it the own way they want to do it. My shepherds, these aren't even my shepherds. I'm going to destroy these shepherds and bring shepherds after my own heart who will actually gather my people and nurture and care for them and instruct them in the ways of me. Okay, All of these things is swirling as Jesus is giving this parable account. And he's saying to this religious group, he's, he's connecting them all the way back to the rejection of Babylon He's connecting them all the way through, all the rejection of the other prophets. And he's saying, does that make sense now when it gets to this point when he curses the temple and he curses Jerusalem and he he foretells its destruction? Why? This isn't just out of like, you know, I'm just really angry at you and so I'm just upset and so I'm just going to smite you. This is a long carrying out thing in the people. 
in the religious people. We can't look at the problem of Christianity in churches today and go, it's the pastors. Yeah, I think it absolutely is partly with them. But you know what? It also comes back on all of us because all of us are made the priests and priestesses of God's kingdom. This is why when Jesus gave the parable about idleness, that we can just sit by idly and not do anything, that doesn't, that's not supposed to happen. That's not an attribute, a characteristic of a person that's filled with the Spirit of God. Who, when would God say, hey, look, you know, I've got all this work to do. The fields are wide for harvest, but the workers are few. I'm going to be in you. I'm going to ask you just to sit and watch your TV every day. Is that how that works? Does the Spirit of God do that? Just say, sit and be idle, do nothing? Of course not. That's not, that's not the way God works. I might have killed this. <laughs> this microphone must, uh, must belong to the wrong prophets and the wrong shepherds, and it doesn't like it. Okay, so I'll just speak loudly. Beloved, what I'm trying to get at here is God, Jesus is making this contrast, and it's very easy to see the facade within the chief Sadducees, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and we can easily see that. What we can't easily see is that when we adopt the spirit of a Pharisee, of a Sadducee, of a scribe in our own lives, and we live through that false religion, we live through that false piety, we live through that false, you know what it's called today? Cultural Christianity. It's the, same, it's the same concept. It's the same idea. What Jesus is trying to teach his disciples as he's going through all of this, fulfilling all of these things, he's saying, look, don't, you're not a tenant that I'm letting out my vineyard to. You are a co-heir with me. You own the vineyard with me. Be concerned about the fruit. Be concerned about its, its efficiency. Be concerned into these matters. Be concerned that the world is full of lost people and they really are dying without Jesus. Be concerned about yourself. Is the word of God literally changing me from within? Is there this invocation that I'm actually wanting God to be more in love with you? I don't want just myself to live and sprinkle with the little Jesus. Baptists, one of the things that separate Baptists from other denominations is, is it believes in full submersion of baptism, right? Full submersion in the water, not just a little sprinkle. But then why do we live spiritually our lives not fully submersed in the Spirit? We just sprinkle a little bit on our lives and we just carry on about our world. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? Jesus is encouraging us as he's speaking... I don't know what would have happened if these, if these Sadducees and all these religious leaders would have, would have repented. They clearly are so locked in their way, they're refusing to change their minds. They're refusing to change. They have seen and they have heard the testimony, countless testimony. And the only thing they can say is we got to stop this guy because he's taking people away from us. Our influence is diminishing. Beloved, I ask you, reflect upon yourself. Is there even a glimpse of a polyp of a fig in your life? Is there fruit producing? If Jesus was to walk through the door of this church, what would he say to you? If he was to walk through the door of your home, what would he say to you? Spend time, beloved, thinking about eternity, what like the first 10 million years in eternity will be. Spend time thinking about God, not just the temporary, not just the moment in front of us. God is with us in these moments to see us through. You want to get through some of these stuff? You want to see chains and strongholds break? Do what Psalm 8 does. Worship God and watch the stronghold come around you and chains be broken. Amen? God is saying, come, come, come to me. I have life. I've come to bring life that you might have life more Abundantly than whom? Everything the world has to offer doesn't compare to what God can bring. Do we believe it? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scripture. God, we thank you even for these challenges. God, as I speak, I mean, I even hear myself being challenged with the words that I know. With the words that I know from your text. It's, it's this constant challenge within, this, this constant changing this internal changing within father i pray that you are glorified and honored in all that we do lord i pray 
And I pray, and I pray beginning with me, would your spirit stir such, such a flame, such a passion, such a desire for you and you alone, God, that it, 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 it causes within us a want to fall more in love with you. You call us your beloved. That means you are madly in love with us. But God, I know I can definitely reflect in my life. I don't know that I'm madly in love back with you. God, stir within us this desire where we start saying to you, my beloved, because that's what the text says we can call you. We are your beloved and, and our beloved is ours. God, stir that within us. Stir that within us, Father. God, lead us this week. Guide us this week. Challenge us this week. Convict us this week. Encourage us this week. Help us to be men and women filled with the Spirit of God. God, if there's somebody here that has never accepted you and is realizing, like, I've, I need to get right with you, may today be the day of their salvation. May they turn in their hearts, receiving the work that you have done for them. You have forgiven them of all sin. You have forgiven them of all past, present, and future sin by the work you did on the cross. All we need to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you are who you say that you are. And repent, confess, and you forgive, you lift us up, you dust us off, and then you walk this life with us. God, for those of us that have been walking with you for a while, may we quit taking our hand out of yours. May we leave our hand placed in yours as you lead us and guide us, Lord. All we need do is look. Isaiah 45, look unto the Lord, all you nations, and you shall be saved. We just need to look at you. God, let us not take our eyes off of you. Hebrews 12 Look unto Jesus, the founder and, perfe and, and a perfecter of our faith. Help us keep our eyes looking at you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Beloved.